All right, so tonight we're going to talk about what we believe. And the, so the theme is going to be the creed. So this is a prayer that we pray at Mass every Sunday. We pray the creed. And so we're going to look more into what exactly does it all mean when we're saying the creed. So St. Augustine, in reflecting upon the creed, he says, Let the creed be like a mirror for you. Look at yourself in it and see whether you really believe all that you claim to believe and rejoice every day in your faith. So when we pray the creed, uh, it's one of the most important prayers that we have because, as I'll go into, it's kind of uh, a summary of the things that we believe. So he says, let the creed be like a mirror. So in looking at the words of the creed, do I see myself? Do I see that this has impact upon my life? Do these things mean enough to me that it causes me to live a certain way? Um, because they're not just words that we say. They have deep, important impact upon us. And we look at each of those parts, and he says, do you believe each of these things? Can we truly say, yeah, I do believe that? Because that's what we're saying we believe <laughs> whenever we say the creed. We're saying, I believe, and then we say all the things that we believe. So, and then, of course, he says, and rejoice in the fact that we've received the gift of being able to believe these things. Because that's what we'll find, is that faith, our faith is something that, first, we receive from God, and, secondly, something then we have to live out. Kind of like what I was talking about in the uh, homily this evening, right? Where... God's doing the work, but then we also have a part. We have a work, work to play in it as well. So what does it mean by, to believe? So we say things like, I have faith, or our Catholic or Christian faith. You know, we say we believe things, but what is, what is faith in general? Well, faith is our response to God, who wants to reveal who he is to us. He wants to give his life to us. And in showing us that, it's not just knowledge of God, but it's more than that. It's bringing us an understanding of what life is all about. right? Because we could go to various places and try to figure out what life is all about. right? Uh, it's one of the most important questions we ask. Um, and we could go all over the place and search the internet and find out what the meaning of life is, but God himself wanted to reveal what's the ultimate meaning of our lives. So faith, when it comes to believing God, uh, we'll often call supernatural faith because we can have faith in another human being, right? We can trust in what they say. I believe what you say is true. But when we have it in God, it's a little bit different from just any normal person because God's a little bit different, <laughs> a lot different from any normal person, right? So supernatural faith, by that we mean that we trust God, that what he says to us is true. So we trust that all the things that he has said is true is true because he's the one who revealed it. We believe based upon his word, not necessarily because we have proof of it, you know, we can't necessarily have scientific proofs of everything God tells us. But that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't at all mean that it's less true or it's less trustworthy. In fact, because it's based upon God who can't lie, he can't deceive us, then we know that it is true. It's exceedingly trustworthy. Supernatural faith is also a gift. You think about how you were introduced to the faith. It's when you were very young, probably for many of us. You received it from somebody else. Nothing you did to earn coming to know about it. That's the same way when it comes to our faith. We don't do anything to earn God revealing himself to us in our life. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's a pure gift from him. So we first receive the gift of faith, God's life in baptism. 
So we'll talk about that. That'll come up in uh, later in the creed. It's also an act that we do. So God reveals himself, but then we have to respond in some way. St. Paul will often call it the obedience of faith. Right? You might say your child, you're getting them up for school, and, uh, and you say, okay, it's time to get up. It's time to go for school. And they're like, I believe you, Mom. I believe you, Dad. But then they don't get up. Uh, do you really think they believe you? Like, well, if you believe me, then you'll obey me, <laughs> and you'll get up. So it's the same way. It requires our action. If we say we believe, then it requires a response to him. So uh, I kind of alluded to this question already. Which is more certain, faith, supernatural faith, or science? Often we live in a kind of world who will, that will go always to science. If you want to know the answer for something, you got to go to science, and then you can, you can observe it, and you can run experiments, and that'll prove it that this is the way it is. Well, as a scientist myself, I can attest that science has developed over time, and there's been moments where we've been wrong about things. <laughs> science is based upon human knowledge, so it can be an error. But supernatural faith is based upon what God himself reveals, the all-knowing creator who can't be deceived himself and cannot deceive us. So faith ends up being more certain than science because science is based upon our limited knowledge, whereas faith is based upon God revealing himself to us. So it is faith. Though sometimes we might not think that because we're used to the kind of shakiness of trust in human beings, right? Sometimes human beings don't tell us the truth, right? But you're more likely to believe and trust somebody if you have a relationship with that person, that you know who they are, right? And that's why sometimes it doesn't seem like faith in God is as certain, because we need to grow in our trust and relationship with him. The more we know him, then the greater we'll be able to trust in what he says. So the, what God has revealed to us is very different from other kinds of information in the world. Our faith is very different from other kinds of religions. Because in ours, we believe that God is the one who's revealed himself to us. So um, right in the beginning, sometimes people will compare the Bible and some of the stories, especially at the beginning of the Bible, to certain myths that you find in different cultures. Uh, like Genesis has some similarities with the Babylonian myth. And so some people will be like, see, the Bible is just a myth, just like all these other myths. Well, it isn't because of God's involvement. Our faith is us trying to reach up to God and God reaching down to reveal himself to us. Whereas other religions, like this kind of, it's just a myth because it's just us trying to understand the meaning of, of creation in the world. But God is not, re they're not receiving anything from God, his revelation. So our faith is based upon God's revelation. And that's how the Bible works. It is God revealing to us. So the Bible is divinely inspired because God is speaking to us through it. But it's also written by God cooperating with human authors. So it's God reaching down, mo doing most of the work, but then us reaching up, right? We also have work part as well. So the creed that we're going to be going through, to use kind of an imperfect analogy here, is the creed is kind of like the cliff notes of the Bible. It's kind of a summary of our faith. Um, so if you don't have time to read the whole thing, <laughs> Though I do recommend, you should, we should, as, as Christians, read the Bible. Um, but the creed is based upon God's revelation to us in this way. So there's two big, uh, and to, to break it down even into even a greater summary, if there's two big ideas that our whole faith is based on, it is the Trinity and the Incarnation. The Trinity, that God in and of himself is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's one God in three divine persons. And the Incarnation, which is that the second person of the Trinity, the Son, he took on our human nature. 
and became one of us. He's both God and man. So we'll see that in, in our creed. So some of the earliest forms of the creed um, are kind of, uh, probably in the, we're probably in the form of questions. And we still do that today as part of the baptismal rite. We have, we, re, we, we renew our baptismal promises, um, in a sense, for the child that's being baptized. When we're baptizing an infant, they can't do anything, right? They can't say that they believe. But that also points out to the fact that faith is first a gift, right? Because they didn't do anything to deserve it. <laughs> They're going to receive it. So at baptism, we often put the creed in a kind of question. So on one side here, we're rejecting Satan and, and evil. And on the other side, we're saying we believe in God. And so you'll notice there's very clearly here three parts to it, right? And so we'll see this is the case for our, our creed, is that there are three parts to the creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which fits right in with baptism, right? Because if you remember, how do we baptize? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it goes together with that. So here is the Apostles' Creed. Uh, so this is one of the oldest, uh, longer creeds. We, we attribute it to the apostles. And so I've kind of bracketed there the parts that specifically talk about, that start with the Father, and then the Son basically is the whole middle, longer middle section there, and then the Holy Spirit at the end. And then there's a few things having to do with the church and a few other things at the bottom. So we have the Apostles' Creed, and then we also have another major creed. There's, there's actually several different um, creeds that have been developed through the centuries, but the main ones that we use is the Apostles' Creed, and then, then on Sunday, oftentimes, we use the one called the Nicene Creed. The full name is actually the Nicene Constantinopolian Creed, but that doesn't really flow off the tongue very well, <laughs> so we don't always call it that. The name comes from uh, the time period in which it was developed. Uh, and so this was in the early church, the this first several centuries of the early church. There was questions about who Jesus was. So we had God's revelation through the scripture, very clearly showing that some points saying that Jesus was a man and other points that seemed to indicate that Jesus was God. And so they had to try to understand what does this all mean? And so the church had these different councils, the leaders of the church, the bishops got together and they had to defend what was true about who Jesus was. So we'll see that the Apostles' Creed, they added longer sections in to clarify what we believe against some of the errors that were coming up. So certain errors, like for example, uh, Polinarius and Polinarianism, uh, basically they thought that Jesus didn't have a human soul. Of course, that would mean he's not fully human if he doesn't have a human soul. Then on the other side, we have some, a bishop whose name was Arius, and he kind of denied that Jesus was fully God. Um, you know, it's just, it's just so difficult trying to figure out how he's God and man. So let's just say he's not one or the other. And the church is going to say, wrong. <laughs> and it's going to add some more phrases into the creed to make this clearer. So during these first centuries, the church is going to defend that Jesus is divine, that he's fully God. On the bottom, that he's human, that he's fully man. That he's only one person. There's only one Savior, just one Jesus. But that he has two natures. That he is, has a human nature and a divine nature. So the church has to defend each of those things, and that's where all those different councils come in, and why the creed goes from the Apostles' Creed on one side to the longer Nicene Creed on the other. But otherwise, they still follow the same basic format of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It just is going to go into greater detail about who the Father, the relationship with the Son is, and also the Holy Spirit. There was also questions about the Holy Spirit's relationship with the Father and the Son as well that came up in some of those councils. So, so our Nicene Creed, let's begin to look through that. So it begins with, I believe in one God. Right? So we already, already talked about I believe. We are trusting everything that God reveals to us. So let's go to one God. 
Now, this is something that we find all over in the Old Testament. Here's, you know, as, as God is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, um, as part of that, he reiterates, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall not have other gods besides me. It's one of his commandments. I am the only God. In fact, the most important uh, kind of line of the Old Testament to the, to the Israelites, to the Jewish people, was the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I commend to you today. Teach them to your children. So this is something that the Shema, they'll repeat over and over again. Uh, but this focus that there's only one God. There isn't any other. Uh, something that God reveals to us. And, and actually, we could go through, like, philosophical arguments and actually come to the conclusion that there is, there is uh, if, there's an, if God is infinite, that there can only be one infinite God. There can't be more than one infinite God. But we won't go into all that. <laughs> right, so only one God, though unfortunately the people in uh, the ancient Hebrews, immediately after God gives them the commandments, they fall away and they worship idols. Of course, they had been worshiping idol, false idols. They'd, they were in Egypt to that point, and so that was kind of part of their cultural habit, which is part of the reason why God was calling them out of that. So, unfortunately, they fall in sin, and we do the same thing. We might think we're more sophisticated than people of that time, but like, well, Father, at least I don't worship a statue. You know. Well, yeah, but we worship other things. You know. Anything that we put our time and devotion to that takes away from God, uh, these are the kinds of things that we worship in our life. You know. So, we might worship money and sports and TV and our phones that we're on all the time. All hail to you, cell phone. I cannot live without you. No. <laughs> Um, so, or work, or even ourselves sometimes we put in the place of God. So we might think we're more sophisticated than ancient people because we don't worship false idols. Yeah, our false idols are, we are not as, are, are just as lifeless as a statue of a calf. So God is going to, he continually is going to call us back away from worshiping things other than him. So we believe there is one God. And what is this God like? He is a father. He is God the Father. In the Old Testament, he calls himself Father. In the New Testament, Jesus calls him Father. So this is going to reveal something of Jesus' relationship with the Father. And then we're told by Jesus to call God Father as well. So this is pointing to a very personal relationship that God desires to have with us we actually become God's adopted children. We're adopted as his own. We're his beloved sons and daughters that he loves and cares for. So even though we turn away and we, we go to other things, he continually wants to draw us back to give so that we can live in his life. God is also almighty. He is the maker of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible. So God is the cause of all the things. Sometimes kids will ask the question, like, who made God? It's a really profound philosophical question coming from little kids. <laughs> uh, the answer is, of course, nothing created God. He always was. He is the source of everything else that is. He is the cause of everything else without himself ever being caused. So he creates the source of everything. So he has the ability to create everything, anything and everything. So he makes all that exists, heaven and earth. Uh, anything that does exist, he created. Uh, and really, that's the focus of the beginning of, of the story of creation. It's not so much trying to teach us a scientific explanation of the beginning of the, of the world, but it's teaching us certain truths about who God is and the creation. Is that before creation, all there was was God. And he is good. And he created everything out of love. He just overflowed with love and desired to create everything. He created everything in an ordered fashion. He wasn't chaotic. Certain myths of creation would say that, yeah, things were created out of this chaotic battle between good and evil. Well, the Bible says, no, that's not what the truth of it is. That God created out of love, and there's a great order that we see 
in the way that God creates it. That all creation is good. After every single day in Genesis, first chapter, it says, the God says, and God saw that it was good. Because it's a reflection of him. And that includes us. We are created good. Our tendency to go to other idols other than the one God didn't come from him. It comes from our abuse of our freedom. Uh, we make a choice to turn away from him. So evil comes afterwards. It's not, it doesn't have its origin in him. And we are the most, of all the things God created, we're the most in his image. Uh, because we have the ability to know and love in a way that God can know and love that other creatures can't. So uh, here's an example of the order that we see within the creation story. Even the structure of the different days and what God creates forms a kind of structure. First day, he creates day and night. And then on day four, he creates kind of the elements that show forth the day and night. Day two, he creates the sea and sky. And then day five, he fills it with the life, the birds and the fish. Day three, he creates the land and vegetation and then fills the land with man, with beasts and man. So there's kind of a structure. And then on the seventh day is the day of rest. God rests. And that's supposed to, our life is supposed to lead to the seventh day to rest to eternity. So it also says in here that God created everything visible and invisible. Now you might be like, well, okay, heaven and earth, why do you need to include visible and invisible in there? Well, the reason was is because in the early times in the church, there was certain ideas uh, uh, led by those who were called Gnostics, and they had this kind of philosophical belief that matter is bad and spirit is good. So material, th so if you really want to be holy, you have to get rid of all material stuff. You just strip all that away. All that's bad. But the church says, no, that's, that's not true. I mean, if matter was bad and Jesus took on our human nature, which has matter as part of it, then suddenly God had to take on something that's bad. So, no, we're made body and soul. That's the way God made us. So both whatever is visible, our physical universe, and what's invisible, the spiritual realm, both are created good by God. And we kind of brought this up a couple weeks ago when we talked about angels, right? So we have God's created order all the way from physical non-living things all the way up to infinite, or the, the, uh, finite, purely spiritual creatures, the angels, and we're in the middle there, both physical and spiritual creatures. So everything visible and visible, God created. So second part of the creed we go to is, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. So this is going to be the longest section of the creed because that's what was being questioned at that time, right? Who is Jesus? So what do we believe in? So Jesus is the one we're referring to. And so let's look at the names that it gives him. First one is Lord. So Lord is this divine title that we find in scriptures. It's one that God himself is used of God as well. And uh, I mean, and Jesus has called it, you know, for example, Jesus says in the Gospels, he says, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. You know, yes, I, you're right. I am Lord. In Hebrew, it was Adonai that was used for God, or uh, Kyrios, uh, is in the Greek word for Lord. So Jesus is Lord, and his name Jesus um, isn't just a random name that was chosen. <laughs> it has an important meaning as well. It means God saves, which points out Jesus' identity. He is the Savior, as well as that it refers to his mission. Why did he become why did he enter our world? To bring salvation, to save us. And also Christ. So Christ isn't like his last name. <laughs> Christ is another title, and it comes from the Old Testament. Christ is the Greek version, but the uh, Hebrew version would be Messiah, and it means the anointed one. So in the Old Testament, you have all these prophecies that God was promising to send a Messiah to save his people, and so Jesus being called Christ recognizes that he is the fulfillment of these prophecies, that he is the one who is anointed by God 
And uh, anointed, not only we think about an anointings we have in the church, is done with oil. And that was part of anointings of, 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 of uh, prophets and kings and priests in, throughout the scripture. But even just as importantly, uh, being anointed means he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, uh, which is God as well. Uh, there's a prophecy about that in Isaiah, that the Messiah would have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have Jesus, and what we're going to see is in the Creed, it's going to understand how Jesus is both God and man. So if we look in the uh, scriptures, we see this happening. Mm, we see different times in which Jesus very clearly does things that only a human being can do. And other po points, we see things that he clear, very clearly only God can do. So, for example, he's born of a human mother. Right? What is born of a human is human. <laughs> um, so he must be a man. That was one of the things. They're like, we know his family. He can't be anything more than a man. They would say that in the scriptures. Uh, he worked with uh, Joseph as a carpenter. Uh, he ate food. He had to rest. He got tired. Uh, he, he wept. He experienced human emotions. Uh, he, he suffered, and he died. These are all things that human beings can do that God wouldn't do. We wouldn't necessarily think that, well, how could an infinite God suffer? Human beings can, but can an infinite God suffer? And, but at the same time, there seems to be moments where Jesus is God. You know, the way in which Jesus is born. He's born of Mary without a human father, born of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he performed miracles. As human beings, we don't have that ability, right? Otherwise, there might be certain miracles you'd like to perform. <laughs> but we don't have the ability. He forgave sins. Now you might be like, well, Father, we can forgive sins. You know, I have to forgive my children all the time. Maybe my spouse, too. <laughs> How does that make him God? Well, you forgive somebody when they hurt, do something against you, but Jesus forgives sins when people do things against other people. You know, we don't really go around forgiving people. I forgive you for doing that to that other person. We don't usually do that. Usually we're just focused on what somebody's done against us. So they understood in the scriptures that when Jesus forgave sins, he was claiming to be God. Uh, he called God his father, which, you know, we're used to doing that now, but that's because Jesus told us to do that. You know, setting from the Old Testament times, God would refer to himself as father of his people, but the people were rather reticent to call God father because they're like, well, we're not God. So we don't really use that. He also called himself I am, which is a reference to God's divine name. I am who I am is how Jesus or how God revealed himself to Moses in the Old Testament. And of course, most importantly, he rose from the dead. No human being can do that. Only God has that, has that ability. So uh, there's indications throughout the scriptures on ways in which it seems that Jesus is both God and man. So how does that all fit together? Uh, because we have some of those people in the early church that are like, well, we can solve that by saying he's, he's actually only one of them. Problem solved. And church is like, no, not the correct way. So here is some of what they're going to say with, about Jesus' relationship with God the Father in emphasizing that Jesus is indeed God. So it says that he's the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. So he is begotten. He comes from the Father, born before all ages. So that's focusing on the fact that he existed before anything else. So he's eternal. He wasn't created. You know, like sometimes we would be like, well, Father and Son, Father exists before Son, right? So your dad's existed before your sons did, right? <laughs> but that's not exactly the way it works for God. He is a son who was begotten before anything else. So he's eternally begotten. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So like three different ways to emphasize he's God, he's God, he's God. 
Um, so for example, you know, this light from light, um, that Jesus is the, I mean, light reveals to us so we can see things, right? So Jesus, in a sense, is the perfect image of God the Father. He reveals who God the Father is. That's what it says in Hebrews, that Jesus is the refulgence of his glory, the imprint of his being. Oh, the other important thing, too, to note there is that as Jesus being son, so he's son because he shares the same nature with God. He's, uh, he's divine. We're called sons and daughters of God because we're adopted as sons and daughters. We're not sons and daughters by nature. None of us are God. But we're adopted sons and daughters, whereas Jesus is a son by nature. Begotten, not made. So there's another, another emphasis, right? He wasn't created. Consubstantial with the Father. So there's our big, long vocabulary word, right? Uh, one of them from the creed. And so this is a very important uh, We'll get to that here in a second. We'll look at that in the next slide. But just one more thing about through him all things were made. So we talked about how God the Father is the creator of everything, right? And before, he was the only one who existed, and then he creates everything. Well, this emphasizes is that, well, Jesus created it all too. I mean, he was also part of God, and it was through the word that everything was created, right? Remember how, how did God create everything? He spoke, and everything came to be. So Jesus, the word, um, is through which he came to be. Um, so this word, uh, I won't play the video here, but the word consubstantial comes from part of that, that controversy in the early church as to who is Jesus. And Arius, I mentioned, he tried to say that Jesus was homoousian, that first one, of the similar substance with God. He's not fully God, but he's kind of like God. And so he used the Greek word homoousian with an, with an I in it, or uh, iota is the, the word. But that one iota was wrong. <laughs> the church came to the conclusion. They said that is incorrect. Jesus is not similar to God. He is homoousian, which in Greek meant consubstantial or of the same substance. And so the whole controversy had to do with one letter and one word. It's very important. And because of how important this was, in defending who Jesus is God, that's why we still use that terminology in our creed. We use that special word consubstantial as part of it. So uh, we continue through the creed, and next about Jesus, we say that for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. So there's a lot here that we, got, that we have to look at. So what the main thing that we're looking at is that Jesus, who's God, is going to become man. He's going to take on our human nature. And the way that we describe it is with another special way, another special word, incarnate. Or that's where incarnation comes from. Incarnate literally means to take on flesh. Right? It's a very uh, almost kind of graphic word <laughs> to think about being enfleshed human flesh. <laughs> uh, but Jesus, and, and that's to emphasize that he didn't just come and like take on a human shell. You know, it wasn't like angels could like come into our world and like appear to be a human being to us, appear, appear visibly. That's not how Jesus came. He l entirely became man. He took on our flesh. And it also gives us the reason why, right? It says, for us men and for our salvation. So it has to do with our need to be saved, right? That's his whole mission, right? Jesus means God saves. What do we need to be saved from? Well, our tendency to not follow the one God, right? To go in other directions and follow what will lead us to death rather than the life of God himself. Um, so it refers to another for coming down from heaven. Now, it's not so much that, you know, Heaven is the full presence of God, but the kind of analogy of up evokes God. It doesn't necessarily mean heaven's not like up in the clouds or in like, you know, a galaxy far, far away, you know, but that evokes him coming from heaven. So we'll see the opposite. We'll see him 
return there later in the creed. And by the power of the Holy Spirit. So here is the third person of the, whole, of the Trinity, his involvement in enabling the second person of the Trinity to take on our human nature. That it doesn't happen normally uh, or in the normal way. So it's going to happen through to the Virgin Mary. Um, so let's see, a couple, a couple different things uh, here as well. So Jesus is going to take on our human nature completely, and the church especially was defending this. Uh, and the way they would defend it would talk about how in order for Jesus to save us as human beings, he would save that which he took on. So if he's going to save humanity, he needs to fully take on our entire nature. He can't just be partially human being. <laughs> he has to be entirely us. They would say, you know, what he doesn't assume isn't saved. It's not redeemed. You know, so God maybe could have sent like an angel, you know, or maybe could have saved us a different way, but it was highly appropriate that since we had turned away from God and now created this huge gap between us and God that only God could really fix, but we're the ones who had to fix it because we broke it, <laughs> um, the Savior needed to be both at the same time. He needed to be man because it was our fault for breaking the relationship with God, and he needed to be God because only God can fix it. So he had to be both uh, at the same time. So Mary's role in this um, is, it's very clear that Jesus takes on our complete nature, right? Because he's born from Mary. But the Father, in a sense, is God. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit, so he's fully God as well. But he's fully man because he's born of, of Mary. But there's only one of him. So there's only one person. That's why we'll often call Mary the mother of God, not because she's God herself or was existed before God, but because she's mother of the one man who is God and man at the same time. Uh, the only thing that Jesus didn't take of us is sin. It says that in Hebrews. He's like us in all things but sin, but sin isn't an essential part to us as human beings. It was our fallen nature, what he came to, uh, came to fix. So uh, the other part is, so in this too, it says that he's conceived of the Virgin Mary. Mary is a virgin. And some people might be like, well, you know, you Christians, you know, that's, don't you know that's not possible to have a child and still be a virgin? You know, because that's what we, that's what we, that's what we believe is that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after. Um, Jesus' birth. And yeah, we know it's kind of impossible. That's why it was kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, but it points to who her son is. Other thing, this, this uh, piece of artwork I really like because it co co contrasts the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, who in disobedience to God followed the bad angel and lost life for all humanity. But then we have the new man and woman, Mary and Jesus, and together in listening to the good angel, <laughs> they open up life again for all of us. So to uh, bring in a little bit of the history, that's another part of the important point is that these are all real historical events that occur that we see in the creed. So. This is a, the grotto of the Annunciation in the Basilica of the Annunciation in Nazareth in Israel. So this is the place where we can go, and this was, this, this was a church. You can see remnants of an early church that was built over the place where Mary's home was, where she would have been visited by the angel and told her that she'll be the mother of the Savior. And so at the altar there, it says in Latin, here the word was made flesh. So here we so we know the spot where God came into our world, took flesh. Uh, we know then where he was born. That was in Bethlehem, 
And so you can go to the Church of the Nativity, and below the church in the grotto, the cave that was used as the, 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 the manger or stable where Jesus was born, we have that has been venerated from very early. In fact, this church is one of the, the earliest churches that are still, that weren't destroyed and then rebuilt <laughs> at different times. So uh, there we have, it's marked by a star and uh, this place where Jesus was born. So as we continue, then we go to, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And we might wonder, well, why in the world do we keep mentioning Pontius Pilate, right? He wasn't the best guy to put in our creed. Well, because he's a historical figure, right? You can find him even outside of the scriptures in histories. And so this connects our faith directly to human history. Right? And so that's why the church includes the name in there. Um, because we're emphasizing the fact that this is real history. This is historically what occurred. So he was crucified, and of course we've already referred to his reasons why, right? He, the reason why he suffers death is for the same reason that he took on our nature. It's for salvation, right? The consequences of sin is separation from God's life. It's death. And so Jesus is going to go all the way down, even into death, in order to draw us up out of that. Right? He'll even go through horrendous death, horrendous suffering, right? Because he's taking upon everything, all of us, all at once. So all suffering of, of sin, all evil has ever brought, that human beings have fallen into and, and led other people into, every single thing that we've done wrong in our life, Jesus took upon himself in these sufferings upon the cross. And not just upon his physical sufferings, but in his mental agony as well. Because if you think about it, sometimes suffering, sometimes the mental suffering is almost worse than the physical suffering, right? Because it's like, well, I can handle certain physical discomforts, but the kind of mental things that drive us crazy, that sometimes that's even a harder thing to bear. So Jesus has to bear all of that internal suffering from sin within him as well. So he dies upon the cross and was buried, right? He truly was dead. While he was dead, while his body was in the tomb, but of course we're body and soul, right? So when our bodies go to the earth, our souls are separated from that. And so what was Jesus doing during that? So it says in the creed that he descended into hell. So hell here is referring to the place of the dead. Um, he didn't necessarily go to the damned, but he went to those who, even though they may have sinned, like Adam and Eve, maybe they repented, right, and they desired to follow God, but they had lost God's life. So they couldn't, be, they couldn't fix that relationship with him. They were separated from him, even though they expressed sorrow for him. So what Jesus is going to do is he's going to come to them in the realm of the dead, and he's going to bring them out. He's going to preach the good news, and he's going to bring them forth and open the gates of heaven. So we see in a lot of uh, uh, iconography, Eastern uh, Christian art, is we see the resurrection, Jesus rising from the dead, is primarily portrayed with Jesus raising the dead, raising those who had died in the Old Testament but desired to follow God, even though they were imperfect. And so we see Jesus here, he's going to the realm of the dead. He is standing on Satan there. He's broken open the doors of hell so that they can be freed to go to heaven. And uh, so the first two people that are right there, that's Adam and Eve. And then we see other Old Testament, like, you know, you see some crowns there, like King David. And we see other Old Testament individuals that desire to follow God, but couldn't yet go to heaven. And so Jesus is going to the dead to bring them uh, to heaven. There's a beautiful, really ancient um, homily that we don't know who the author was, but it goes back to the early centuries of the church. And it describes this 
moment of Jesus going to the place of the dead. He says, Jesus goes into them holding his victorious weapon, his cross. So we've got the cross there. When Adam, the first created man, sees him, he strikes his breast in terror and calls out, out to all, My Lord be with you. And Christ replies to Adam, And with your spirit. And grasping his hand, he raises him up, saying, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. And it continues on, and it talks about, I am your God, who for your sake became your son, for whom, for you and your descendants, now speak and command with authority those in prison. Come forth, and those in darkness have light, and those who sleep rise. So it's just a really powerful image of Jesus coming down there and calling those out to heaven. So Jesus descends to the dead to bring those who have already died. And then on the third day, he rose again. Right? And so the third day is important because Jesus, not only, not only was it Jesus who said, you know, destroy this temple on the third day, I will build it up again. He's talking about the temple of his body. But there's also Old Testament prophecies of a third day as well. Like, so for example, Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. And before he was spit back out, Jesus also refers to this in the Gospels and says, you know, if you're looking for a sign, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. <laughs> so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the earth. Jesus rises again. And, you know, Jesus rose some people from the dead right before he rose from the dead. You know, like, for example, we have Lazarus. Um, but Lazarus is basically resuscitated, in a, in a sense, right? He returns to normal human life here on earth. You know, the sign of that is that when Lazarus comes out of the tomb, he's still wrapped up in all of his wrappings, right? But not so for Jesus. He isn't just, like, resuscitated. He is absolutely transformed. And it's so much so, right, that they don't recognize him right away, right? Mary, Mary Magdalene in the garden comes to him, and she's like, she thinks she's the gardener. He's like, they've taken my Lord. I don't know where they are, where he is. Of course, she didn't realize that actually he uh, is the gardener, the gardener of heaven, <laughs> the new paradise, uh, until he calls her by name, and then she recognized who he is. Same thing with the other apostles, too. They at first don't recognize him. Um, because of how gloriously transformed he is. Um, he has abilities that you know, a normal human body doesn't have. Right? He walks into the room where the, where the disciples are, locked, where a normal human body can't do that. So he's absolutely transformed. It gives us something of the promise that we also receive. In the, tr in the creed, we'll talk about our resurrection as well. So we also know places for this as well. So these are some images from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This church is built over Calvary, where Jesus was crucified, and over the empty tomb. So right here is the altar where Calvary is. And uh, underneath the altar in the glass cases, you can see the original limestone hill upon which Calvary was. And uh, on the other side there, uh, when I was there, a few years ago, it was under construction, so it's not the greatest of, of uh, images. But there's like a little house that's built over where the tomb was, and you can go into it. And you can, well, you can't touch the original limestone, like place where Jesus' body was laid, but because it, it's covered over with, uh, with uh, marble. Uh, but within the last several years, they actually did open it up, and they found that, indeed, there was a marble uh, bed of, the, of a tomb for, from the first century. Uh, it mentions in the creed, it's, it puts in a little phrase, all this was happening in accordance with the scriptures. So that's an important line because it's all these things are predicted by God. Um, he, because he's the author of history, he knows what's going to happen before it happens. Right? So we have in accordance with the scriptures, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. So here's the prophecy from Micah that he'd be born in Bethlehem, as well as, you know, even his suffering. Here are some more prophecies from Isaiah, uh, describing in great detail some of the things that Jesus would have to go through. 
So it says, he bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds, we are healed. He was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. So it's describing that he would have to go through this kind of suffering in order to forgive our sin. So all of this happens according to what God had already spoken through the scriptures. And then it says Jesus ascended to heaven. So after his time of revealing himself to his apostles here on earth, he ascends back to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So here's the beautiful thing about the ascension is that Jesus goes back not just as God, but he goes back as man, right? So human nature forever is now in the presence of God, in the person of Jesus, and that when in him ascending back to God, he's able to bring everybody with him. So because he brings human nature to God's presence, now we in our human nature also have that hope of being there with him. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So we say this in the creed. Judgment. We don't always like thinking about judgment, right? Quit judging me. Church is so judgmental about everything. Well, judgment doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, it can be, right? One of the judgments that could happen is hell. But that's not really what God desires for us. He desires heaven for us which is a good judgment, right? I mean, whenever, you, uh, whenever sports teams are, are competing, right, you get a trophy, that's a judgment. It's saying you're better than the other team. <laughs> um, so we can have good judgments as well. So Jesus will return in glory. We will know when it happens uh, to judge the living and the dead, and then his kingdom of heaven will have no end. I won't go into too great a detail of this because actually the end of ordinary time, the readings at Mass actually do go into this, and this coming weekend, I'll, uh, the readings kind of address this, so I'll kind of go into some of um, these um, ideas about judgment and uh, the, the last things. So his kingdom will have no end. The kingdom that he starts while he's here on earth will have no end in heaven. It will go on forever. Uh, look, we'll look quickly at the very last section of the creed here. Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit, so it also affirms that the Holy Spirit is indeed God. He's the, he is Lord, just like the Father and the Son. He is the giver of life. This is where, so he's also God. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, so they are together in Trinity. They, he should also be adored and glorified as God, just like the Father and the Son. And He's spoken through the prophets. So the reason why it mentions the prophets from the Old Testament with the Holy Spirit is to affirm that the Holy Spirit was there before the full revelation of the Holy Spirit, which came at Pentecost. Right? So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles at Pentecost gives them life enough to be able to go and spread the good news of the gospel to all people. The spreading of the good news of the gospel to all people is in the presence of the church. So next in the creed we say, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Church that was, had its birthday with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and has these characteristics. It's one, as is described in Ephesians, that one body, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So there's one, one church. You know, if, if Jesus is only one man, if he's one person, God and man, he's not two of them, then his body can only be one. And his body, the church, there can only be one church. So the desire is for all to be brought into his one church. So the church is one. It's holy. It's not holy because every single person that's a Christian is always holy. Sometimes we're not very, sometimes there's Christians that are really not holy at all. Uh, but that doesn't make the church not holy. The church is holy because of the presence of God within it. That's why the church is holy. But we are called to holiness, like I talked about. You know, we celebrated the saints, and we are to participate with God in, trying to, in becoming holy. And that's really the church's purpose, is to sanctify, is to bring holiness into the world. So we don't necessarily want to judge the church based upon her worst members, but... Does the church create holiness? Does it create saints? 
one holy Catholic. So we call our church Catholic, uh, and that has a specific meaning. It's a Greek word that means universal. It means whole. So it's the faith that contains the whole of everything that God has taught us, as well as it's meant for everyone. So this is a, uh, an, an image from above St. Peter's in Rome. And so this is St. Peter's Square. Well, it's kind of shaped like arms, right? Embracing the world. Come into our arms as the church, Mother Church. So very motherly figure, right? Come here, let me embrace you. So the church is for everyone, saint and sinner alike. And the church is apostolic, which means Jesus founded it upon the mission of the apostles. So from the very beginning, how, do one, how does one know if you're in Christ's church? It's because that church is connected to the apostles. And so we have the bishops that are the successors of the apostles. So through history, the apostles knew that they weren't going to live forever, so they chose men that would become bishops and leaders following them as well. So we have an unbroken line of popes from the very beginning. So St. Augustine says that for his part, he wouldn't believe in the gospel except moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. That if it wasn't for the founding of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, it's like, I don't know if I would be able to have known that this is what the truth is. Just figuring it out on my own. Finally, we talk about baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I mentioned that earlier, that that's the purpose of it. It applies God's grace from his passion, death, and resurrection to us individually through baptism. We believe in one baptism. We, believe it, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So this goes along with that Jesus' second coming, where there will be judgment, where we can be, have a good judgment and enjoy everlasting life. Um, those who have died will receive a body glorified in some way, likely like somehow like Jesus' is, except that we're not exactly like Jesus, right? <laughs> we won't be God, but we'll be like him in some way. So um, this season at the end of Ordinary Time goes more into some of these things, and I'll talk about some of those ideas in uh, homily for this, this coming weekend. So that is our creed. All that we believe, and St. Augustine says, remember, this is a mirror for us to look in. Do I believe each of these things? Do they have important impact on my life? Do they make a difference that I believe all of these things? And hopefully when we pray this creed every time, uh, whether it's at Mass or a part of our own personal prayer, that uh, it will have greater meaning for us. Uh, we'll know what each of these, these parts mean, what we believe. So...